After posting a video on LabVIEW's Jitter Analysis Toolkit, I was asked if I'd consider making a video comparing it with LaCroix's JTA software. Teledyne was nice enough to provide me with the access code for the JTA. The LabVIEW Jitter Analysis Toolkit that I've been using is currently available from NI. By contrast, both my Wavemaster 8500 and the JTA2 software are now about 10 years old. These obviously don't represent what Teledyne currently offers for DSOs and measurement software. During this video I'm going to be comparing the results of the two packages. In all cases I'm planning on using the Wavemaster to collect the information. My plan is to set up to use the JTA to make the measurement first and then extract the sample data into LabVIEW. Hopefully this should provide us with an apples to apples comparison. During the video I'm planning on using both clock and data sources. My plan is to really put both packages to the test by attempting to analyze some very difficult signals. The first source I plan to use is going to be our analog devices eval board. This is the same board that I used previously. Uh, we've already characterized this clock. It also provides me with two clock sources. This is a very low phase noise oscillator by Fox. It's a TCXO. We can gain access to that through this SMA connector here. This is the next oscillator I'd like to test. This is by Nell. This device uses a comb generator and a filter to produce the output frequency. This is a prototype board that I put together with a Xilinx FPGA on it. It has a few BNC connectors for outputs and some 50 ohm drivers. This board is going to do us a few things. Inside the FPGA I have a couple of blocks. One is a DDS and a state machine which is used to drive a pseudo random number. The synthesizer is nothing more than an accumulator, a register, and a last bit register. Depending on where I set the tap for this output register and what I set N to here will determine the frequency. The interesting thing about this circuit is if we look at the air coming out of it, depending on the frequency, the air is going to increase. So the higher the frequency, the more the air we're going to see. If we work in areas where the divisor is by zero, the air will go down. And then as we work away from that, the air increases and then decreases. So my plan is to pick a point for some of our tests that would be reside in this area here. So we'll have very high jitter driving a pseudo random number, which will be a serial output data clock. Normally looking at a histogram of the phase noise, we'd see some type of a Gaussian shape. Using this type of synthesizer, I expect we're going to see spurs, and these spurs would be at the sample rate of our clock. Each one of these spurs is going to have some shape to it, and the plan is to get enough overlap here where it will be very difficult for the software to actually be able to phase lock to this. So let's start by using the analog device's phase lock loop board. Again, this is just a demo board. Uh, it has a differential output clock, and we have this set right now for 1.7 gigahertz. The Wavemaster, again, it's about 10 years old now. Uh, this particular one is running Windows 2000. One of the nice features with it being a newer type oscilloscope is it is Ethernet based. I happen to have this on my local area network. It also has the ability to drive a standard uh, VGA monitor. So it's actually connected to the second monitor of my PC system and I have a secondary keyboard and mouse that are located above my normal keyboard that I can use to control it. This is our LabVIEW software that I put together. Again, this, uh, this is the same program, no changes. This program again just basically encompasses the included uh, examples. From our previous demo again, this is the software used to drive the analog device's eval board. I have the board basically set to the factory defaults right now. Setting up to make the measurement, we'll set C2, vertical, Now we'll go ahead and set the time base. Use 20 giga samples. 15 nanoseconds per division. 
We already set it for TIE. This is all information that I showed previously. Uh, again, this is looking at the eye diagram. Here we can see the spectrum analysis of the jitter, the reference phase noise, and the histogram. And we can see again with the current configuration, I'm measuring roughly 1.8 picoseconds with lab view. Currently I have the WaveMaster set for 20 giga samples a second. I've got the memory set to the maximum length. There is no difference in the way it's collecting right now versus the way LabVIEW is collecting the data. As a matter of fact, when I acquire the data, I'm not changing any of the settings on the LaCroix. This is the output of the jitter measurement. TIE, which is time interval error. Looking across this way, we have the actual value being read, the mean, the minimum from the mean, the maximum from the mean, so these are in peak. The standard deviation and the current number of samples that are required to make this measurement. So what we're interested in the standard deviation or standard deviation is the RMS of the jitter. It's very close to what we're reading with LabVIEW at 1.8 picoseconds. So selecting the histogram uh, another menu will pop up here. This allows me to set the number of buffers that I want to measure or the number of samples. So currently it's set to 100 samples with 100 bins and that's why the histogram looks so coarse. If I wanted to do more averages I could change this number to let's say 100,000 cycles. Just hit OK and, and we can see now that we have a very Gaussian and smooth peak. Uh, the bins are still quite coarse and that's because we have it set to 100 bins. So let's go ahead and we'll open this up to uh, say 10,000 bins. The TIE error uh, can either be based on a clock or on data. We happen to be using a clock. We're using 50% for our trigger point. We can do fine frequency here. This will determine the frequency of the clock that we're supplying. Uh, we can enable our software PLL. You notice in this case that uh, the custom frequency is 1.6997369 gigahertz. This menu allows me to zoom into the histogram. This is the horizontal. and here's our vertical. F2 is now showing the uh, in five picoseconds per division. This is showing the trend of the period. Top trace is channel 2 in time domain. The yellow trace is showing the histogram of TIE. This trace is showing the histogram of the period and the fourth trace is showing the Fourier transform. Center point by the way is about 5 gigahertz on this. Turning off the time domain and placing everything onto a single screen. Again here the blue we can see the Fourier transform, pink showing us the histogram of the period, and yellow showing us the histogram of TAE. In this case we're showing a 3D representation of the Fourier transform.
This is looking at the eye diagram from the Fox TCXO. This is actually meant to be a 10 megahertz precision input to the eval board. As we can see here, the eye diagram looks very poor, but I thought it'd be an interesting test case. Looking at it in time domain, we can see that LabVIEW's done a fair job trying to align its phase lock loop. The purple again is the signal, and the green is our phase lock loop. This is our spectrum, again our reference, and our histogram. LabVIEW is showing me roughly 91 picoseconds RMS jitter. Looking at the same data with the LaCroix. We can see here the LaCroix is showing roughly 65.5 picoseconds worth of jitter. I'm not really surprised with the edge rates being so unclean that uh, we wouldn't see this difference between the two. So while we're set up for 10 megahertz, what I'm going to do is connect a AWG uh, 2041 ARB in place of the uh, Fox oscillators output. Okay, with the ARB attached, you can see here it's very close to 10 megahertz now. And we can see now the RMS jitter is 36.3 picoseconds. So the ARB is actually much cleaner. The fact that the Fox oscillator is actually a very precision device. Uh, it's very low phase noise, uh, gives you an idea that there is some errors going on here. I would expect the Fox to actually provide a better output than what this ARB is. And we can see here the eye diagram now it's actually very clean. Uh, what we, we, this is what we expect. Look at the signal and time domain. Everything is going to be dead on. Uh, again, just because the edge rates are a lot cleaner, this is pretty much what we'd expect. RJ now is measuring uh, 21.9 picoseconds with LabVIEW. So again, the two now are much closer. Again, probably within the air tolerance. For the next test, I'm going to be using this Nell Custom Oscillator. This is based on a comb generator with a filter. You can see it's 1 gigahertz. The reason I'm using this device is because it's been previously characterized. I believe Wavecrest started in 1998. Uh, they are the leader, or were the leaders at least, in jitter separation. Um, this particular data is for the Nell oscillator. Uh, this was collected about 10 years ago on a Wavecrest uh, SIA 3400. Uh, this is a software package called GigaView. Software has a few different views. We can look at the Fourier transform, total jitter, the histograms, and the oscilloscope view. Off to the left side, we can see several measurements that were made. I'll try to zoom in here. All right, so at the top, we can see the basic voltage amplitudes, rise times, fall times, voltage min, max, peak to peak, undershoot overshoot. Down here is our timing measurements. These are the timing measurements that were made on the Nell. Here we see a period mean which is uh, 0.995 femtoseconds. Here we see the period 1 sigma, period peak to peak, period hits. So it's made a hundred thousand measurements. Pulse width, pulse width minus, these are deviations from the mean, uh, the duty cycle, the frequency. You again, see it's a one gigahertz clock, and RJ and DJ, and then the total. RJ in this case is 3.368 picoseconds. We can see about 2.5 picoseconds is attributed to this first spur connecting the Nell oscillator to the WaveMaster. See a similar waveform. And again, we can see it's reading roughly 1 gigahertz. Of course, the jitter here, again, it hasn't been set up yet. It's interesting, you can see it's about 300 picoseconds, or 300 nanoseconds worth of jitter. There's no way.
In order to repeat these tests, I'm running the Nell oscillator off of a couple of batteries. Here we can see the eye diagram. It's quite a clean source. Uh, it is a differential clock. We're only using it in single-ended mode. That was how the data was originally collected. And we can see that the RJ is 2.769 picoseconds. And again with GigaView with the wave crust, previously we had measured an RJ of 3.368. So these two numbers are fairly close. If we look at it in time domain, we can see LabVIEW, here's the signal, and we can see LabVIEW has actually done a fair job with its PLL syncing to it. So again, what's kind of interesting here is about 300 and some odd megahertz, we have this very high spur. Um, we didn't collect with the wave crest out here at the 700 megahertz range, but that spur is definitely showing up on our uh, histogram here. Again, this is looking at the JTA2 software from the WaveMaster, and we're seeing a standard deviation of 6.68 picoseconds. For the next example, I'm going to use a small board that I had put together several years ago. This is based on an old Spartan 1 FPGA. It's 5 volt logic. And again, the FPGA is currently programmed up with a state machine that creates a pseudo-random number. The random number then is presented on one of the BNCs at the front. It will be used as a serial data signal. As we can see here, looking at the 7200, uh, we've created an eye diagram. The way we've done that is turning on the persistence. There's a trigger that's located in the center of the data path. And I'm just collecting several times with the persistence on. Again, it's a pseudo-random data stream. So it'll be interesting to see how it's able to recreate a clock from this. Here we can see a live view of the data stream. Not very clockish like. You see that our data is actually quite slow. Here we're looking at a single pulse for the clock. You can see the uh, edge to edge here. This is at uh, 20 nanoseconds per division. You can see here our width is roughly 132 nanoseconds. The plan here isn't so much to run high speed data in as it is to see how well the two packages are able to replicate a clock. With our pseudo random serial data being fed into the LaCroix, you can see it up here at the top. I'm setting a fixed sample rate of 500 mega samples per second. And for now, if you want to zoom in here, you can see our here we can see the pseudo-random data being generated. What I do is I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna set this for 200 microseconds per division, and that'll give us two uh, milliseconds of data collected. What we do here is we select data input, and in this case, if I hit find frequency you're gonna see that it's all over the place 4.9, 5.2, 8.1, 8.0, 7 7.7 .7. so it's not able to lock to this not too surprising data is NRZ is selected interval is set to edge to edge for the weave clock we're not going to use the PLL and we're going to use both edges you can see here the jitters kind of wandering around I'm seeing standard deviations of 11 10.5 10.3 10.4 10.3 10 10.2 10.1 So let's go ahead and we'll look at what LabVIEW gets us. 
So here's our collected data with LabVIEW. It's done a reasonable job trying to track this. You can see where it's picking the edges versus where the actual data resides. Again, this is quite noisy data, so I suspect both of these packages are going to have a bit of a rough time with this. But again, we can see our uh, RJ number here is roughly uh, 10.02. You can see how bad this is looking at the eye diagram here. And we can see the noise off the histogram with a very, with quite a few spurs. <laughs> we can actually make this quite a bit worse. So let's go ahead and uh, what I'm going to do is pick a, a far worse condition to try to run these in. <laughs> okay, here's looking at our eye diagram of our test pattern. You can see how widely dispersed this is. It's very deterministic and it's very wide. And this is because of how the synthesizer works. If we look at some of this data in time domain, and we overlay our data. You can see here that it actually has a very difficult time trying to track this. which is not too surprising but it does a better job than what I thought it would have so for RJ we're measuring 41.8 microseconds <laughs> yep it's that bad looking at the histogram as I suspected we'd see spurs at these discrete locations. Again, this is caused by the synthesizer. So again, 40, basically 42 microseconds. And again, looking at the data with the JTA2, we're seeing roughly 28 microseconds. Again, it's doing pretty good. I'm surprised that uh, both packages are able to handle this. Again, here's showing the histogram of the TIE in yellow and the raw data in pink. There's a couple of problems I see with the, uh, the LaCroix software. First of all, here's your documentation for it. You got a couple of pages and that was it. I mean, you could figure out how to use it, you know, if you really knew what you were doing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the documentation was pretty poor. Things like uh, being able to automate it, for example, um, there's no mention in the book how to do that. Uh, so there's no mention of the jitter analysis inside of the manuals for programming, or at least there wasn't back then. From a documentation standpoint, it was pretty poor. From an analysis standpoint, you know, if you're just looking at measuring random jitter, it's pretty accurate. You know, both of these packages, of course, are using the exact same sources, the same scope to do the measurements, so you're really just evaluating the software, but, you know, both packages did a really good job. I'm pretty, pretty amazed that uh, uh, both packages could pull off some measurements using those uh, last sources. Um, but, you know, the lab view has got features which are basically to be able to strip apart the jitter into its base components. So I can actually determine what's periodic jitter and what's random. Um, and that's a huge deal. And the LaCroix, it can't do that. And again, if we look at what was available at the time when the JTA software was out, again, this is the software from Wavecrest. And this thing could give you pretty much anything you wanted to know about reverse engineering a competitor's PLL. So, you know, I'd have to say Wavecrest was definitely king of the hill back then. It should be clear though that the JTA software was only about a $3,000 add-on. So if you already had invested in the scope, 
and you needed to get some basic jitter measurements done you were looking at three thousand dollars to purchase the wave crest just to make these measurements I think back then we were looking at about an additional fifty grand so so there you have it hope you enjoyed the video